Amen. Contending in faith. You know, as I was thinking about the title for the lesson, as God had given me the message, the title for the message, you know, Chloe mentioned uh, a message about fighting for Jesus, and, and that title kind of hung with me. And I said, but that, that's not the word I'm looking for. I need something similar to fighting for Jesus. And I had to understand the concept. The message she heard was the, the woman with the issue of blood that, that fought her way to Jesus to touch the hem of his garment was healed. And, and the effort she put in to do that, being a weak person, a person that had given all her sustenance to go and took, she was fighting for Jesus to get to him. And, I, and that was a wonderful message. But I said, you know, there's so much more in the things that Jesus did that we can learn to, to not just fight for, but to contend for Jesus. And I said, all right, Lord, contending, what does contend mean now? <laughs> and so here's the definitions of God. It said, contending is struggle to surmount a difficulty or danger. I said, ooh. And contending also means to engage in a competition or campaign in order to win or achieve something. And when I thought of campaign, I thought of military campaigns. And when the military goes and, and contends against the enemy, and we know about contending with fighters, they, they, they talk about contenders, and boxers will come and they'll have boxing matches and they'll fight, and they're contending, and, and you're contending to achieve something or to gain something. Or you're struggling through something, so you, you're contending or you're, you're coming up with a plan. Uh, you're coming up with a way to face the adversity that you're going through or the struggle that you're going through. And, and that's the part of contending I want to talk about tonight is, is the struggle to surmount the difficulty or danger in your life. One thing about Christ is wherever He was, there seemed to be a crowd. It may not have been there to begin with, but it didn't take long before the crowds came around. Something about Jesus that draws people. You know, that still happens today for the born-again believer that is living a life in Christ and walking with Christ, they draw people to them. You say, why don't we see our churches even more full? Than, why, why, don't we, why, is there not, why is there so many empty chairs tonight? We'll get to that in a little bit. But there's, wherever Jesus is, when he's put on display, he draws people. And they're not all there for the same reason. Some people went to see a show. I'm not talking about a circus or a sideshow, but I'm talking about what miracle he was going to do next. They showed up to see what was going to happen next. Some people showed up in faith believing. Some people sought out to, just to see what was happening. Some went to learn. And then there were those others who showed up to seek out how they might find fault. And you know, there's no difference in our life today. It's, as we live for Christ, people are going to keep an eye on us. And there's going to be those people that want to learn from us. There's going to be those people that are watching to see how we're going to fall so they can justify themselves. There are going to be those who may be seeking how they can catch you doing something and turn you in. But you're going to have an eye watching you. Jesus draws a crowd. And tonight in Mark chapter 2, we'll see about four guys that were contending in faith. We'll see about the life that four guys lived and how it was going to make a difference in the life of another man. And the Bible tells us, and again he entered into Capernaum after some days, and it was noise that he was in the house. <laughs> so Jesus was in Capernaum, he was at a house, he wasn't at the tabernacle, he wasn't at church, he was in a house, and it was noise, there was spread about that he was at this house. He said, well, how was it noise so much? If you go back at the end of chapter 1, you'll see where uh, Jesus healed a, a leper, and he told this leper, uh, you, be healed Go, tell, go show the priest and give your offering, but don't tell anybody. And we're going to see that this leper, he went out and did just the opposite of everything Jesus just told him to do. He didn't go to the temple. He didn't go give his offering. And he went and told everybody what was going on. 
So he's running around in his area and, and it's spreading around in Galilee that Jesus is performing miracles and healing. And, and that's something that Jesus did, though Jesus came to what? To seek and to save the lost. He came to teach and, and he came to restore a relationship. It wasn't just him coming to make miracles. He wasn't there just to heal people of physical things. He wanted to restore the relationship between man and God. And so there was noised about that he was now in Galilee at a house. And guess what happened? A crowd shows up. In verse 2 it says, And straightway many were gathered together, <laughs> in so much there was no room to receive them. No, not so much as about the door, and he preached the word unto them. You know, folks, there's nothing that says when you have people at your house, you can't preach the word of God. Amen. I'm glad that we don't have to come to church just to, just to have the word preached. Jesus was at a house, had a gathering of folk, and he was preaching. He wasn't there to heal. He wasn't necessarily just teach. He was giving them the word. And as he was there, in this crowd, and the Bible tells us a little bit, there were Pharisees, and you, there's two more accounts of this. Um, Matthew gives an account, and... Uh, Luke gives an account of this same story. And, and one of the accounts just leaves out uh, the part of, of these four guys in a minute where they're going to go through the roof. He leaves all that out. But as he preached, Pharisees, scribes, or lawyers of the law, doctors in the law were there. There were saved people or, or believers there. Those that had faith in Jesus, there were people there that were lost, coming to hear what was going on, coming to see. And we know that with the scribes and the Pharisees, they were there to find how they might find fault. That always seemed to be in hard, not all of them, but there was always a few of those that are always trying to find fault in what Jesus was doing. And so we know that was on their heart, and it tells us that a little further down. So as all these people there gathered to see what Jesus was going to do next and to see what he was saying, there happened to be four believers. He said, Brother, how do you know they were believers? Because Jesus talks about it here in a minute. There were four believers that had a friend. How many of you here tonight know Jesus Christ is your Savior and you got a friend? They had a friend that was lost. He said, how do you know that? Because he needed to be made whole. He said, but the Bible is going to tell us he, he, he was paralyzed. He had to pause. He was paralyzed. Yeah, but Jesus is going to say something in a minute that's going to clue us in that this man was lost. See, there was four friends that needed to contend in the faith and needed to come up with a plan to get their friend to Jesus so that he could be made whole, not only physically, but so that he could come and have faith in Jesus Christ too. And so these four guys... Heard about Jesus coming to this house. The noise was about. They went up to the door and they couldn't get anywhere near the door because there were so many people they couldn't get inside. Verse 3, and they come unto him bringing one sick of the palsy, which was born of four. That's the four believers and the one sick man, the lost. And it says, and when they could not come nigh unto him for the press, they uncovered the roof where he was. And when they had broken it up, they let down the bed wherein the sick of the palsy lay. And there's a whole lot of stuff going on in this verse. So these guys are contending in the faith and they had faith that Jesus could heal them and that Jesus could uh, bring them in, into his fold, so to speak. They had belief in what Jesus could do. They just had to figure out how to get their friend there. So they went to the roof of the house, right? I guess there weren't any windows. I don't know. I'm not sure about how all those houses are. There wasn't any other way to get in, but they went to the roof. Carrying a man, a paralyzed man, in his bed or couch. It's translated two ways. Four guys carrying a guy onto the roof to let him down to Jesus. Now, I know if Jesus was at my house and I heard a noise on my roof and I saw a hole in my roof, I would not be too worried about what was Jesus getting ready to do. See, me and my flesh would be mad that there was a hole being put in my roof. Okay? Especially after we just had these storms and we got brand new roofs put on. Now, I don't know what was going on there. 
But what we don't see is anybody getting upset that a man is going through the roof. And that's amazing. Because where Jesus is, there our focus is, and we're not worried about the worldly things. They uncovered the roof, they broke it up, and he let him down. The Bible says when Jesus saw their faith, he saw their faith. He saw the faith of the four. And because of the faith of the four, and they're contending in their faith and getting their friend there, he said unto the sick, the paralyzed man, Son, thy sins be forgiven thee. You see, that lets me know that that man was lost. Yes, he was paralyzed, and yes, he needed physical healing, but he needed spiritual healing. And because of the faith of the four other guys to get him where they needed to be, he met Jesus, and he was able to have his, his sins forgiven. You see, Jesus spoke specifically to the one man. There was four other guys. Why didn't he tell the other four that their sins were forgiven too? You see, that's why I think, and that's why I believe that they already had a relationship. Somehow, somewhere along the way, they've come across Jesus. And they already believed. And they knew they had to do anything and everything they could to get their friend to him. Now, folks, I asked you a while ago if you had friends. And I seen some raise their hand. That was kind of rhetorical. But, and I said, how many of you have friends that are lost? How many of you have been a friend like these guys and are doing whatever it takes to see that your friend knows about Jesus and gets to see Jesus? You see, there, there's a reason why our, pew, our pews are empty. It's because a lot of us are not contending in the faith. We're not doing everything we can to get the lost and reach them and bring them to where Jesus is. He says, is Jesus only in the church? Absolutely not. You can tell them and you can lead them to Christ just by giving your testimony, right? Tell them how you got saved. You can lead them to Jesus right there. But it's a wonderful thing about when you come to know Jesus, you want to fellowship with Jesus and you want to fellowship with like believers. So these gentlemen let their friend down and Jesus saw their faith and said unto the sick of the palsy, Son, thy sins be forgiven. And here's that other part of the crowd that was sitting there waiting for something to criticize. Verse 6, there were certain of the scribes sitting there and reasoning in their hearts, why did this man thus speak blasphemies? Who can forgive sins but God only? You see, there's those unbelievers. The unbelievers in the crowd that were just seeking to cause trouble. The unbeliever that was just seeking to see where they was going to fall, how he was going to falter, and how they could justify their own life. You know, a lot of times that's why folks are really trying to scrutinize how you live and how you mess up. Do you see the lost want to find a way to make themselves not look so bad? Those that don't know Jesus are not comfortable in their sin. And when somebody they do know that knows Jesus is trying to live a holy life, it makes them even more uncomfortable. And so when they can find that when a Christian messes up and, and falls down, it makes them feel better about themselves. It does. Why did this man speak blasphemies? Who can forgive sins but God only? I see, but Jesus knew what was going on. And immediately when Jesus perceived in the spirit that they reasoned within themselves, he said unto them, why reason these things in your hearts? You know, Jesus knows the heart. He said, whether it is easy to say to the sick of the palsy, thy sins be forgiven thee, or say, arise and take up thy bed and walk, but that you may know that the Son of Man hath power on earth to forgive sins. He saith to the sick of the palsy, I say unto thee, arise and take up thy bed and go thy way into the house. You know, Jesus was showing that he was God. And the scribes kind of had it right, though. Who can forgive sins but God? And yet it didn't fully register in their head exactly what was going on. But Jesus forgave the man, the, the paralyzed man, forgave him of his sins. And then healed him. He told him, get out of his bed. Go home. Walk home. He says, and immediately he rose and took up the bed and went forth before them all. And so much that they were all amazed. 
and glorify God, saying we never saw it on this fashion. Never saw it on this fashion. You know, there's some interesting things as we just went through with that. I, I want to talk about the four friends a little bit more as they contended in faith. They were faithful in their walk. They were faithful in what they did because they were trying to get their friend to Jesus and they weren't going to let anything stop them. And interestingly enough, when the crowd was there, they didn't let the crowd stop them. There, there, I guess there was maybe a little pushback from the crowd as they tried to go in. You know, as we as at YEC, they... they Come time when you try to come in, you know, you get there and they're getting ready to start, and kids are all up at these booths, and there's a narrow walkway, and you try to walk in the crowd, you can't hardly walk. And what would normally take maybe three minutes to a walk to a seat would take 15 minutes because you're pushing through a crowd, pushing through a crowd of people. The, the crowd had a the crowd dictated the path that I took to get to my seat. This crowd was trying to dictate the path that these four friends were going to take. And folks, the crowd in society today and the world to today will try to dictate how you're going to live your life. They will try to tell you that you're not going to worship God. They'll try to tell you that you can't worship God openly. They'll try to tell you you can't speak the name of Jesus. The crowd will try to dictate your relationship with God. The child will try to dictate your walk with God. But if you're contending in the faith, you'll find a way around. You'll find a way through. And that's what these guys were doing. They didn't let the crowd distract them. They didn't let the crowd stop them from their faithful walk as they sought another way to get to Jesus. Something else these four guys, these believers weren't worried about. They didn't care what the crowd thought. They didn't care. They had a plan, and their plan was to see that their friend come to know Jesus or come to meet Jesus. They want to see him healed, and they want to see him saved. And they didn't care what the crowd thought. They went to the roof. They did tear it up. Now, somewhere in here, I don't know, the Bible never says that they went back up there and fixed it or anything like that. I would assume they did. Somebody did. I'm sure they didn't leave a hole there. The Bible doesn't say. But the point is, it didn't matter to them what the crowd thought. They did what it took to make sure a friend come to know Jesus. You know, the devil likes to use the crowd to, to, change, to sway our thinking. There's an opportunity coming up to go hand out gospel tracts. There's going to be a crowd there. And sometimes just the fact that there's a crowd is enough deterrent for some people. I'll be the first one to admit that I don't like standing in the middle of that crowd trying to weave my way to get to my seat. I don't care for that. I'd much rather have that direct path. But I know that I have to contend in the faith so that others come to know Jesus. And it's important that we don't let the crowd dictate what we do. We can't let the crowd scare us. We can't let the crowd control us. We can't let the Pharisees and the scribes get to us, the mockers, the ones that will laugh, the ones that will call us name. You see that all those people there, though some were saved, some were lost, some were hypocrites, the Bible only tells us that there was one man whose, son, whose sins were forgiven that day in a full crowd. You know what that tells me? That tells me when you go into a crowd to hand out tracts and to give the gospel, that if one person comes to know Jesus, that it was worth it. It was worth it. Anything that you have to go through, whether it's somebody cussing at you, spitting on you, laughing at you, pushing you around, if one person comes to know Jesus, it's worth it. Now, I hope we don't have to tear a roof. I don't think that would be something prevalent for today. But how's, how have you been contending in the faith? 
Have you been faithful in your walk so that others might come to know Jesus? The paralyzed man. He had to have some sort of faith too. I didn't see anywhere in there where he was saying, no guys, don't take me. Don't take me. I don't want to go. He had a little hope and I'm so glad that Jesus said that we just have to have faith as a grain of a mustard seed and we can move mountains. That man just had to have that little bit of faith to allow his friends to take him. And Jesus met him where he needed to be. Jesus met him where he was at. And he come to know Christ. How amazing and wonderful. Christian walk's not always easy. It wasn't for Jesus. The only perfect, that ever, perfect man ever lived. It wasn't easy for him. I can, I, we can read in scripture where they come out against him to get him. And Jesus would have to just slip through the crowds to get away. To get away. It wasn't easy for him. At any moment, he could have easily spoke something and, and just totally messed up the per reason why he was coming down, but he didn't. You see, Jesus was contending in the faith also. He knew God had a plan. And that was the whole point where he was, when he was praying in the garden, he said, Father, if there's any other way, let this cup pass from me. Jesus knew it was about to get hard. Folks, it's going to get hard sometimes. He knew it was about to get hard. He knew it was about to hurt that I don't even know so much that he was worried about the physical pain that it was going to cause, what was going to cause, but the weight of sin being laid upon him. I think he knew what was coming. He said, God, if there's any other way, let this pass. He said, nevertheless, not my will, your will. He said, God, you've got a plan, and we're going to go according to your plan. Oh, I'd like to take an easier way. There's sure got to be something, you know, and, and, and too many Christians, we always want to take the easy way. We always want to take the easy way. We don't, want to, we don't want to take the hard way. When a lot of times it's the hard way that draws us closer to God. It's the hard way that makes us and, and molds us into what we're supposed to be. If we're constantly taking the easy way or if we're constantly letting the crowd dictate what we do or if we let people stop us, what use are we? We have no purpose. If that's how we live. Our purpose, God's plan, is to spread the gospel. To tell others. And if we're not doing that, then we're not contending in the faith. We're off plan. 